In 2014, I attempted suicide. No, the screen's not buffering. I'm not frozen. In 2014, I attempted to take my life. Hi everyone, my name is Tom and I am the mental health runner. And I'm here today to talk to you about my story. My story on mental health to hopefully help empower anyone to ask for help or even just to ask their friends, are you okay? So let's get started with a couple of statistics. In the UK, we see this number all the time, this one in four. One in four people will encounter and experience a mental health condition at some point in their life. So I want you to think of four people. It could be friends, family members, even work colleagues. And the chances are, that one of them may also be suffering with a mental health problem. Another statistic I want to bring to your attention is this one in 20. One in 20 people in the UK have a personality disorder diagnosis. And the reason I want to share that now is because it's almost the reason why I introduced the session like I did. You see, my moods can be very much on a knife edge. If one day a friend could say, hi, Tom, how are you? And I'll think, oh, fantastic. I've got friends. I'm so happy. I've made them really happy. But if that same person's having a really bad day and they just go, hello, well, my mood can go the opposite direction. I have that negative spiral start of what have I done wrong? Have I upset them? Have I offended them? And that's kind of what it's like for me experiencing borderline personality disorder. It's why... I mentioned I try to take my life at the start and how I'm so happy. So let's get started. Let's get started on my story and let's start from the very beginning. At home, I had an absolutely fantastic childhood. I had two loving parents and two amazing brothers. Now the person to my right in the picture is Rob, he's the oldest, and the, picture, the person to the left of me in the picture is Will. Now, outside the home, it was completely different. I used to have to sprint to school because if I didn't, I'd be thrown to the floor. I'd be beaten up, quite heavily assaulted. And it would be horrific. It'll be all the way through school. It'll be in the way from school, all the way to school. And I got that rise out of me where I just burst into tears, as, as you would. Now, Will was the guy who always looked after all of us. He always made sure I was safe or made sure, made sure I was okay. And there's no greater feeling knowing you have that until sadly it's taken away from you. Unfortunately, Will died on the 25th of May, 2009. Just 12 hours after walking down the aisle. Just 12 hours after that very photo was taken. So that was my rock gone, my crutch, my support, however you want to put it. Now, I couldn't break down and cry because, well, if history serves me right, I'll be bullied. I'll be beaten up, I'll be assaulted. And that's not a life I want to go back to. So I did what every man is told to do in today's society. Man up. Man up and bottle up all your emotions and just throw them aside to serve another day. So that's what I did. Let's fast forward five years. I met my partner, Amber. I got a mechanical engineering degree and life felt really good. I had friends, family, and also health. But straight away after this photo was taken, I started to encounter the first signs of my mental health, my poor mental health. I started to hear things. Now these things I'd hear would be like all of you right now just somehow turn the microphones on and shouting abuse. You're fat, you're ugly, she's better without you. And like I said, it's like you were speaking to me now, not like a cognitive thought, like what's on, what's on TV tonight, what I'm having for tea tonight, all those kind of things. This was as if it was real, as if people were around me. Now, I didn't tell anyone because, well, I was scared of myself. And because I didn't tell anyone, it then gets worse. These voices took control, punched the wall, smashed the window, kicked the door, and I could do nothing but comply. This house that I'm sat in right now was completely demolished. 
Now, Amber, who is absolutely incredible, could see something that I couldn't. She could see that I was not well. I wasn't looking after myself. I didn't want to be here. But I couldn't see that. I thought maybe this is the way I'm made, made the way that I'm supposed to be. That's because it then gets worse. I then started to see things. Now, I'd either see my brother stood in the corner of every room, or I would see blood on my hands, as if it was clear, thick congealed blood all over my hands. Now, again, Amber is an absolutely incredible person, but something's got to give. She was there throughout the whole thing. But even then, that support has to come to an end. Amber's bags were packed, and she was literally walking out of my life. I got on both my knees, I grabbed her by the hands, and I begged for her to stay. And she said, yes, okay, I'll stay. But you've got to get some help. So the next day, I did, and I saw my GP. Within about five minutes, I was signed off as unfit for work. Depression. Now, I can appreciate some people, if they are diagnosed with depression, it feels like a label. It feels like they've got this stigma straight away attached onto them. Now, as I said, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've grown up with tinkering with cars and things like that. So I saw this as a, okay, something's not quite right. I can fix this. That gave me a bit of respect where I then saw psychiatrists, I saw counsellors, but also enough where I could open up to my friends. On face value, when I told them, I told them everything that happened, all the scars that I've still got on my hands. And they were really happy because they could see the exact same thing you can see right now. Unfortunately, that support came to an end when they saw firsthand my psychosis and who I thought was my best friend's birthday party. Then a couple of days, I had social media accounts made up my name and I had a torrent of abuse again, as if I was back in school. But this time I couldn't escape it. It was on my phone, it was on my laptop. I couldn't get away from it. it really made me feel like the, any chance of getting better was just literally clinging on for dear life. I really thought I was starting to lose a fight for survival in the war against myself. But then that's when it also gets worse. Don't come back. We know you're faking it. That's just one of the many texts that came through to my phone with some of the people who I used to work with. On that day, I stood up, told Amber that I loved you. I went out to the garage and I hung myself. Now, like I said at the time, I was, I was a big guy. I didn't look after myself. I was about 23 and a half stone. The ceiling joist broke. I fell to the floor. And what felt like seconds, Amber burst in through the door, found me on the floor, ligature still around my neck. But like a true professional, she just checked to make sure I was okay, called an ambulance, and then straight to A&E. Now, in A&E, we got split up. I was given some medication. I was still in psychosis. As soon as I got home, I took an overdose. That's two trips to A&E in one night. I really thought that was it. There's no recovery from this. It's never going to get better. In 2018, there was over 6,500 suicides. Now, that is the most recent number that is, is out there. But that's roughly about one person every two hours. That is a statistic I never thought I'd possibly could have been part of. So before it gets better, before the turning point, the diagnosis, I was in this thing that I call the treatment quagmire. Now, this is the place where it's not very well explored. You're kind of in the middle of nowhere. But without the support of other people and with a map and some direction, you could possibly lose your life like an actual quagmire, like a moss. I was not well enough, for, I was too unwell for one service and not unwell for another. So I was in this middle ground, this limbo, this quagmire. 
really made me feel alone, not wanted, and basically no hope. Some of the crisis team quotes were, we don't need you in here. They said to Amber, as I mentioned earlier, who's my care and partner. When I returned to A&E after taking an overdose, I see you've gobbled up all those tablets then. And the other question was, what do you want me to do about it? I don't know. I don't know because quite frankly, I don't want to be here. So how do I know what I want to do about it? It would be about three quarters of a year until I was finally seen by a psychologist and a diagnosis was given. Now, like I said, I live with borderline personality disorder, but also PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder and social anxiety disorder. Now it gets better, <laughs> I promise. This is the turning point. So we have this thing, well, we did have this thing in Lincoln, um, which was for Rethink uh, the Mental Illness Charity. And they put a session together for carers. It was once a week, and it was for people who could have a respite from the people they're caring for. Now, they made a session one evening for the carers to bring the people they're caring for. Amber came in, told me all about it, and I laughed. I laughed and mockingly said, I'm, I'm not going to go because what if it doesn't make me feel good? What if it makes me feel like there's no hope? Now, at this point, I turned to Amber and said, no, I'm going to go. Not for me, but for you. I owe you this. I left that session feeling massively empowered. I met people who had the same diagnosis that I did. I even met one person who started out as a mechanical engineering apprentice, and he went on to help build the Burj Khalifa, the biggest building in the world. Now, if someone's done that and built one of the biggest buildings in the world and has got the same conditions I have, what's going to stop me? What's going to stop me from trying to do the things that I want to do and empower me to do what makes me, me? I felt incredible. I told Amber, and Amber said, you've got a couple of friends from school still, haven't you? I said, yes, I've got some, some friends still. Well, two. Why don't you try and do a podcast? So I thought, okay, well, you know, you're right about this. Let's try a podcast. So that's when me, my best friend and his cousin started the Triple Mega Super Threat podcast. And I can appreciate it's going to be a lot of blank expressions. And I don't blame you. <laughs> to be honest, I don't blame you. This was just three guys sat in the smallest room in my house, having a beer and just talking about anything, literally anything. It would be movies, it would be Marvel films and comic books, it would be music, it would be general news, politics. For me, my go-to was RuPaul's Drag Race because I love RuPaul's Drag Race. Now, amazingly, we started to get emails. Emails through saying, we love what you're doing. That's really great. What's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on that? People were sending us fan mail just saying they really enjoy the show. Even better, we got an iTunes email. Congratulations, you're on the iTunes top 100. Hey, get in. That lasted roughly about three minutes. Sorry, you are no longer in the iTunes top 100. But that didn't matter. Again, this was three guys just talking like we're in a pub, just chatting and being friends. And people loved it. So that's why I want then want to take the next challenge, the next challenge to better my life. I decided to take up running. Now, that first race <laughs> nearly killed me. That was a 10K race and I weighed 23 and a half stone. Now, that really was a hard race. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't fast, but it didn't have to be. This is me just rekindling my life. The embers that were nearly out of my life were now starting to fire up like a furnace. And I wanted this phoenix to fly. So in seven months, I'd lost about seven and a half stone. I felt incredible. I learned how running changes people's lives, how running just gives you that space to think. It gives you that space to enjoy where you're at the minute and how it just transforms people and it really helps you to run happy. Now, because of this and my transformation, how I learned how running and physical activity helps you mentally, I then needed a next challenge. 
So in 2019, I was one of the one of the 45,000 people to take on the London Marathon. With a time of five hours, two minutes. Yeah, you could say <laughs> I let Mo Farrell win. But it doesn't matter. That medal to many people is just to say, look at me, I've done the London Marathon. And quite rightfully so, because it is a really big achievement. For me, it's my first place medal. For me, that medal is saying you're here. You've beaten it and you've beaten the only person that matters. And that is yourself. Now, I don't know if anyone's done long distance running, cross country, things like that. After a race, you really don't want to be touched because your body is just in agony. Now that day, Amber was poorly. So I'm so sorry, I can't come meet you. I'm, I'm too poorly. That's fine. Stay in the hotel. I'll get some dinner on the way back and, you know, we'll just have dinner in, in the hotel room. Now, at the end of the race, someone jumped on me. And as you can imagine, I was about to unleash verbal hell. <laughs> Amazingly, it was Amber. She actually came to see me running through the streets of London. I couldn't hear her because the amazing support through the streets. But this picture means so much to me because this is us. This is the raw thing of me and Amber and our marriage. This is me living. This is me reliving my life and being the person I love and the person who's kept me alive. Now, before I kind of wrap up, I want to leave you with one anecdote. I used to play football. Not very well, admittedly. Um, very, not very well at all. And one day I got a phone call from Leisure Leagues and they said, Tom, we need you to step in to help a team out. Okay, yeah, it's fine. I will see you at seven o'clock at kickoff. Okay, brilliant. Now, when I got to the, the game, you know, I missed an absolute sitter of a, of a shot. It went out for a throw in. It was awful. At half time, something weird happened. Someone on the opposite team just fell straight on the floor. Now, this thing that took over my life where I'd smash the house up and I'd hear things, this psychosis, it took over again. I sprinted down to the opposite side of the pitch to see if he was okay. And he'd stopped breathing. His heart had actually stopped. Now, straight away, I started CPR. This thing that took over my life is now helping someone else. I started CPR, got the help, and... And amazingly, a year to the day that that happened, I was able to go to the exact same spot where he went down, able to share a beer with him and just be there. All because that thing that took over my life where it was so destructive and it wanted me to just end my existence on this planet, it helped someone else. You know, if I didn't help him that day, if I wasn't there, if I my suicide attempts had gone through, there's every possibility that that chap may have died. I'm being more dramatic, I know. But that could have been two lives for the price of one. Now, it feels incredible for him to still be here, and we're very close friends still, and it means a lot to me that I've helped save someone's life and they're still here because of my actions. Another kind of way that I've kind of bettered my life and how I've lived with my mental health conditions. So I kind of just want to wrap up now with just sharing some of the things that I'm currently doing and what I've done in the past and what leads me up to this place now as mental health runner. So let's start at the bottom left. So the NHS logo, I'm a governor for the Lincolnshire NHS Mental Health Services. So I'm helping hold the service to account and to help shape it, to make it better for other people to go through and get the support they need, holding them, to, holding them to account. So just trying to help wherever I can and so people get the better help and quicker. Now, there are two pictures on the bottom right, the surviving the war against yourself. That was a presentation I did in America for the charity NAMI, um, which is the same as like Mind and Rethink is for us. Also in that, there's the TEDx logo for Brave and Paul. And I did a, I've done a TED talk for our TEDx talk, uh, TEDx Youth at Brave and Paul, on this very story, on this very subject. In the middle left of the screen, 
that's me and Amber with our book, Surviving the War Against Yourself, where it's my story from the very beginning, from when I was a child to now. It's also got Amber's story in it. So whenever, whenever you read it, you can see both my side and Amber's side. So you can say, I'm identifying with Tom. Maybe I need to get some help. Or maybe you're reading, oh, I identify as Amber. So maybe I need to get some help for me and some support for, for that other person. The picture next to that that says running, that is my run group called Run Talk Run Lincoln. And that is where people can talk about our mental health in a safe environment, but also running, talking and being active, both things that helped save my life all together in the same package and what I do for Lincoln. Now, top left is the Pennine Run. So this year, I'm actually running the Pennine Way. It's about 270 miles of mountains, and I'm wild camping the entire time. And also um, raising some money for Rethink to say thank you. Um, I'm following my dad's footsteps. He did it in 1984, and I'm hoping to finish it on my 30th birthday, which um, is the 16th of June. So that's uh, later, uh, later on. Next to that is the First Steps Forward program. So that is a charity that me and my wife have set up to help people get access to a pair of trainers, some very basic equipment, and also a very like a, like a program. So people can meet other people with mental health issues and be supported and to help them overcome possible boundaries. And finally, to the top right, is I'm part of the Brooks Run Happy team. And that feels incredible because I'm, I'm now a sponsored runner from someone who wanted to end their life to now being someone who's, who's a sponsored, technically, athlete. And it feels incredible. Now, I want to leave you with two mantras. So the first mantra is something I've stolen, admittedly, and... I want to get let you, I want you to steal it from me like I've stolen it from this 18 year old student in Lewisham. If you go through any time scale with a mental health problem, whether it be one minute, one second, one hour, whatever, with a mental health problem, you're no longer a sufferer, but you're a survivor. Now, when I said that, this student stood up and said, I don't like that. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. What would you say? I'm a thriver. And you know what? I completely agree. So, as someone who failed their GCSE English the first time round as a published author, yeah, that happened somehow, I've made a word. Let's all be Sir Thrivers. Let's all be the survivor of that initial point of our poor mental health and then thriving with it get the support we need, using it as a tool to help us progress our careers, to help us progress school, to help us to progress anything in our life. The second mantra, if there's one in four people who suffer with a mental health problem in their life, does that one in four? That means there's always three other people who can ask the question, are you okay? And save a life. My name is Tom. I am the Mental Health Runner. Thank you so much for, for watching. I just want to leave you with one more question. Are you okay? Thank you very much.